Entrepreneurs Over 40, Episode 54, with Kathy Nesbitt talking about worm farming, sprout farming, and laughing yoga. Oh my. It's for people that are sustainable-minded, people that care about the planet, people that want to have more, like a healthier body. So when we're growing our own food, we want to have a good beginning, which is creating good soil. That's what composting and worm composting does. It's nature's way to make soil. You're listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40, the show for somewhat mature entrepreneurs and side hustlers. And now your host, Greg Mills. Our guest today joins us all the way from Bradford, Ontario. She's a worm advocate and the founder of Kathy's Crawley Composters. Established in 2002, this environmental business specializes in vermicomposting and organic diversion. She even gave a TED Talk on the wonderful world of worms. Since then, she's gotten into growing sprouts as a superfood and has her own laughing yoga program. Without further ado, Kathy Nesbitt. All Here right. I am. Now, Kathy, can you take a few moments and fill in the gaps from that intro? Bring us up to speed with what's going on in your world today. Yeah, absolutely. It's the 20th anniversary of my worm composting business. Can you imagine selling worms by the pound for 20 years? Wow. <laughs> right? I know. Yeah. The thing about this crazy business that I chose or that chose me was is that I don't really have repeat customers. So the 2080 rule doesn't apply to this business. <laughs> Thank goodness I have so much energy. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. So if you mentioned that you don't have a lot of repeat customers, do you have a lot of raving customers that recommend you? I absolutely do. You know, I just hit over 10,000 customers. I have a lot of raving um fans. I have a lot of cheerleaders. I have a lot of people who don't have worms, but admire what I'm doing and they respect how this is helping the planet, you know, by mitigating our food waste. That's one thing we can all do since we all eat. <laughs> now, did you come from an entrepreneurial or inventor's background at all? Did anybody in your family while you're growing up have their own business or invent anything? Uh, sadly, no. I mean, I say sadly because I didn't have any mentors. I didn't have anybody in the family to look at and say, oh, that's what I want to do. You know, I got the message work hard, get a job, work hard, be loyal, be faithful, and you'll get a watch in 30 years or whatever, whenever the time comes. <laughs> I never understood why you needed a watch when you retired. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what kind of watch would it? Because didn't you work for Belova? <laughs> wow, you did do some research. I, I was the president secretary at Belova Watch. Yes, I was. I have a whole host of watches and clocks. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. So what does Kathy's Crawley Composters do? So we ultimately are an education business. What, what happened Why I started my business was our landfill. The landfill for the greater Toronto area closed in 2002. And we started shipping garbage out of the country to the U.S. Sorry. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> you, you know, you're welcome. This was a deal with the governments, right? This had nothing to do with the people, but it was a bad decision. I mean, a waste of money, a waste of just uh, this wonderful resource that is rotting food <laughs> that we go, ooh, gross. But that's what is the beginning of soil. You know, if we compost that or worm compost that, it turns into this beautiful nutrient-rich soil. So I was like, ah, six million people in the greater Toronto area, half live in condos, townhouses, without space to do outdoor composting. So I thought, oh, I have a solution. So I started my business thinking this will be great. Everybody will buy what I have because they need it. Again, if I had entrepreneurial background, I would have, they would have told me, don't do something that people need because people don't buy what they need. They buy what they want <laughs> and they exactly. don't want worms in the house. It's not gender. It's interesting, Greg. I have a psychology degree and I find it fascinating because it's not gender. It's not women or boys or girls or whatever that prefer worms. It's people that love gardening, that are fans of the planet, <laughs> that want to help preserve it and, and be more sustainable. So if one of the partner is not into worms, it's going to be a more challenge for the other partner to say, hey, we need to get worms in the house. I could see that. 
Yeah. So shortly into my business, I realized that people weren't interested in what I had because they were afraid of worms. And with my psychology degree, I've discovered that people may have been traumatized in the schoolyard by worms after a rainy day, or maybe by a sibling, who knows, you know, somebody chasing them around with a worm. And if we get traumatized, we're not looking to that as a solution. You know, and I chose media as my marketing strategy. So I've had hundreds of article, TV, radio, I have a documentary, but you're not even listening to that. You're not reading that article if worms are not for you. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, how am I going to do this? And I realized, um, or I start at that point, I, I was like, let me start doing school workshops. Um, so in 2002, I started to do school workshops and I thought, okay, now I just need to ha wait 20 years for them to have buying power. I made it. <laughs> so if I hear you right, your next business venture will involve sharks. <laughs> <laughs> what got you into worm farming and to being an advocate for worms? It started when I bought my house. It was 93. I moved out of Toronto into Bradford, uh, about an hour north. And I bought my house. I had a garden. I had a composter. I was very exciting. And then our landfill closed. And that was the impetus. As an avid gardener and composter, I knew the value of the food waste. I knew that it was really important to convert it. Like the worms are the original alchemists, really, because they convert something that we think as like a nasty, gross something smelly and awful that we need to just throw away into something that, that converts our food into something that's more nutrient rich. You know, the worms take the organic matter, the food waste and the paper, and then their poop or the castings, fancy word for worm poop, <laughs> is nutrient rich. I'm not saying anything new, but our food is broken because our farming is broken. We do large agra, we do monocropping, which is like acres and acres and acres of wheat or acres and acres and acres of corn and we grow corn for fuel we grow it to make plastic we, like we need to feed people and we grow corn and stuff for the animals a lot of those two products wheat and corn are both very highly genetically modified which means they're not really natural anymore because they've been modified <laughs> and, and you know this is getting pretty technical i think to bring it back to basic, the worms eat the material, they turn it into soil, and then we can grow more food naturally without chemicals. The worms provide this wonderful plant food in a form that's easily accessible to the plants. People will ask me, are you a gardener? And yes, I garden, but I'm not a gardener, I'm a soil maker. And when okay. we have wonderful nutrient-rich soil, the soil looks after the plant, nothing for us to do. So who is vermicomposting for? Ah, that's a great question. I would say everyone, like every entrepreneur, <laughs> <laughs> everybody needs what I have. Oh, but we don't buy what we need. Right. Okay. It's for the avid gardeners, for sure. It's for people that are sustainable minded, people that care about the planet, people that want to have more like a healthier body. So when we're growing our own food, we want to have a good beginning, which is creating good soil. That's what composting and worm co composting does. It's nature's way to make soil. I would say it's a great thing for schools. It's a great lesson. And during this cuckoo time, 2020 was our busiest year. Because school, everyone was shut down, schools were closed, and, you know, people were looking for something for their children. So I was getting a lot of calls. Oh, the kids are home. We're looking for a project. How do, what do I care about how the worms get in the house? <laughs> right? So great. Yes, yeah, so let's have a little project for the kids. The longer we were shut down, the more urgent it became. Because in Canada... We import about 60% of our food, six zero. So when our border closes, it's a problem. Our grocery stores empty very quickly because we don't have the food coming in. And, and this is a, a global problem, right? We know now supply chain issues, there's breaks with people off sick and just there's the whole system seems to be broken. And I think it's raising awareness, like opening up our eyes, like, oh, whoa, we can't just depend on the system anymore. 
we need to be more sustainable. So as time went on, it became more urgent. Calls were not just, we want a little project. We want to start a garden. What do we need? Oh, we need soil. Good. What do we need? We need a compost or we need worms so we can make some wonderful soil. And this is for everybody. If you live in an apartment, I know people will say, ah, I don't have a, a place to do gardening. Okay. If you have a window, you can grow something. You can have some herbs. You can grow some greens like a lettuce or maybe a small little planter box. If you have space outside, even better. But if you have a balcony, you can have a little bit expanded. I think that's where my mission is, is helping people to understand why we need this. So I, I'm pretending I'm your typical customer. I've okay. gotten my pound of worms. What are my next steps? Yeah. So you actually want to have the home set up first. <laughs> okay. For the do-it-yourselfers, any container will do, an old Rubbermaid, any kind of bin that is an old Rubbermaid. <laughs> no, the bin. <laughs> Uh, any container, and then you need some kind of bedding. So just like outdoor composting, the worms require a carbon nitrogen mix. So the carbon or bedding is shredded paper, could be leaves, straw, cardboard, any of your paper products. Then you need a little bit of soil. The soil that I want people to use is outdoor soil, not potting soil that you buy at the store, because potting soil is sterilized. We're adding the soil for the microorganisms. Worms don't have teeth, so there's little organisms, microbes in the soil that help to break down the food for the worms. They're really the heavy lifters, so they do all the decomposition for the worms, and then the worms come along, they're the cleanup crew. You need some eggshells or calcium carbonate, something to balance the pH, and then a little bit of water. That's it. You mix all your ingredients together, and then it should be the consistency of a wrung out sponge. Add your worms on top, allow them to naturally make their way into the bedding. And then when you're feeding your food scraps, you pull back the bedding, add your chopped up food in the hole you've made, make sure it's covered so you don't get fruit flies. And fruit flies are one of the major objections. Like people are like, oh, I don't want to have fruit flies. So I say, right, nobody does, not in the house. So I ask people, have you ever had fruit flies? And then I wait for them to say yes. <laughs> right? Because most of us have experienced fruit flies in the house. And then I say, good. Have you ever had a worm bin? No. Okay, good. Then I say, you know, if you've had fruit flies and you have not had a worm bin in your house, you know, the fruit flies don't come from the worm bin. You have never had one. So the fruit flies come from the food we're adding in. And I'll use bananas as my example. When we bring the bananas home from the grocery store, well, maybe they're green, depending where you live, <laughs> or they're yellow. As they start to get speckled and ripen, that's the perfect environment for the fruit fly eggs to hatch and fly around and bug us. So something we can do, this is for even if you don't have a worm bin, you don't want, want to ever have one, to not have fruit flies in your house is give your fruit a quick rinse when you bring it home from the store. Oranges, melons, all of those fruits have the eggs on them. Okay. Now, going back to the paper products, could one use typically like use um, shredded paper from the office or is there certain things like would packaging be off limits? Yeah, great. I would say the bond paper is fine, like from the, the printer or whatever. Is, that's great. Newsprint is better because it, it's more absorbent. Paper towel is fine. The paper egg cartons and drink trays the compressed paper product that carries the drinks. That's mm -hmm. perfect. Corrugated cardboard is wonderful. I would say leave out magazine paper. It's a little bit too glossy. That's It's too chemicalized. And also for the colorful flyers from the paper. Mm -hmm. Toilet paper rolls are great. Paper towel rolls. All of these things are great. You just might need to chop them up a little bit more. Same with coffee filters. Beautiful thing. You just want to, you know, shred those up. Now, are there specific things that I should and should not feed the worms? They, oh, these are great questions, Greg. Yes. So all of your fruit and veg, coffee, tea, pasta, rice, beans, grains, plant clipping, cereal can all go in. I would say leave out meat, dairy, sauces, anything greasy. And from the fruit um, category, I would say citrus and garlic and onions. I know they're not fruit, but from the vegetable, whatever 
fruits and onion and garlic. I guess that's vegetables. Now, you touched a little bit about the Rubbermaid containers. Can you describe what all you would have to do? I'm assuming you would have to poke some holes in. And how would the typical person get the the byproduct, the worm poop, or the black tea to use in their garden? So if you're using it like a container, there are systems to help manage the moisture to collect the tea and that are self-harvesting. I can talk about that in a moment. But with a Rubbermaid, it's about three to five months from setup to harvest. There's a lot of factors, temperature, moisture, airflow, particle size, right? How small you chop up the scraps, a lot of factors. Three to five months is kind of an average. Once your material's converted, then you want to do your harvest or separate your worms and your compost. The easiest way is the dump and sort. So you dump your bin on a plastic sheet, put it in small round piles. The worms are photosensitive or afraid of the light. So they'll go down into the piles, scoop off the top, scoop around the side, maybe an hour to do a bin that size. While you're, the worms are making their way down, you would set up your new bedding. So then once you get them separated, you can add them right back into their new home and use the black gold, <laughs> the compost, on your gardens. It's difficult in a single bin to collect the tea. I would say in a single unit, if you want to make compost tea, the castings are water soluble. So you could just take some of the castings, put it into your watering drug, stir it up, and then it will dissolve and be kind of tea color. And then you just water your plants and have liquid fertilizer. Okay. So is there like a specific proportion that you would need to use like in a gallon I'm assuming you'd put them in like a gallon milk jug or something along those lines. Would there be a specific proportion that you would use of water to the castings? Yeah, if people want the the measures of that, they can certainly Google how to make compost tea. Again, for the do-it-yourselfers, you can get a like a fish tank bubbler and mm-hmm. actually brew the tea if you brew it for 24 hours. You have to keep it aerobic. The thing about compost tea is it's aerobic, meaning it should never smell like rotting. It it shouldn't have a, a bad odor because if it does, the oxygen in that material, same with your compost, by the way. So if you seal it, then there's no oxygen, new oxygen, and the bacteria in that material will use up the oxygen. And then when you go to use it, it'll smell bad. Plants always require aerobic bacteria to grow. So you wouldn't use that smelly stuff on your plants because that'll be harmful. Same with the compost, you'll you'll need to make it aerobic. I, I don't really have specific measures. I would say in a gallon, you would want, say, a cup or two of castings, just mix it in again, it's water soluble. Or you can put it in a cheesecloth if you didn't want the particle bits left. So you don't have to let it age or anything. Good to know. What type of temperatures do the worms prefer? Or will they thrive in it? Yeah, so this is indoor composting. It can be outside spring, summer, fall. Of course, I'm talking about Canadian climate, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So some places, the optimum temperature is 60 to 80 Fahrenheit, 16 to 20 Celsius. So room temperature is optimum. Better too warm than too cold. And I'm cautious when I say that because I'm again in Canada, so it doesn't really get too hot here. (laughs) Right? People say, can I put it outside? Yes. Now, if you're going to put it outside, you did say about having holes and I didn't address that. If you're going to have holes in your bin, you do need holes. It's aerobic process. If you are going to put your bin outside, I would say don't put holes in the top, put them around the side. Because if it rains, then your bin will get maybe too wet. So if you have them around the sides, that's better. If you're going to just leave it inside, just put holes all over the top or around the side. You can't have too many holes. You can't have too many. The worms don't have bones, so they can crawl out. Don't be alarmed, people. I know they're in the house. They're not going to crawl out if you're looking after them properly. And if they crawl out, just know that they're not going to survive. They're not going to crawl around your house and be all over the place because they're 90% moisture. So even as a worm grower, my house is not uh, moist enough to have the worm survive outside the container. And the only reason they would crawl out is if the conditions were not right in. 
right? They, if it's too acidic, so they're getting burned, so they're climbing out because it's too acidic. If there's not enough food, if it's too wet, there's a, a lot of factors. They are living creatures. Okay. Now, with the population kind of self-regulating in that they they can't get, they could never overpopulate, or do you have to cull the herd, take some of the squirm out of the worm bin and maybe create a new worm bin? Yeah, that's beautiful. They do self-regulate. It's so beautiful. So the worms will multiply and increase in number based on available space and available food. And so at a certain point, people may have a mass. And I love that you use squirm, a squirm of worms. That's the proper collective Yeah, don't, don't try and look that up on Netflix, by the way. <laughs> you get the horror film. Yes. <laughs> Then you'll really be freaked out about worms. <laughs> yeah, so they regulate. Isn't that magic? I think that the nature is so incredible. Nothing for us to do. However, at a certain point, people could expand their their system. If they're like, oh, we're vegetarian or vegan, we create way more scraps than, than a pound of worm can manage. Beautiful. Um, so you can, at a certain point, take out some of your worms, set up another system. The worms that you took out will reproduce. The ones that you added in the new system will fill that container. You know, so it's it, it's really a beautiful thing. Okay. Yeah. Now, how does this tie in with kathysprouters.com? Yeah. So my working title is Kathy Crawley Laughing Bean Queen. So worms, sprouts, and laughter. That my very first event that I was exhibiting at in 2002 it was Earth Day 2002. Very poetic. I met a man who was selling the sprout grower that I'm now selling. And I was like, it looks like a little spaceship. And he's going to be 90, 93 this year. He was 92. And, or he was 72. Sorry. He, he only aged a year and 20 years. <laughs> That's a living testimonial for the beans and the sprouts. I didn't know anything about sprouts or sprouting. He introduced me, this little spaceship thing. And I said, what is that thing? And why is everyone buying that and not my worms? <laughs> he explained to me what sprouts were, how to grow them, why we need them. And I said, okay, I'm in. So he said, if you're going to do this, start your day with two tablespoons of sprouted mung beans for the enzymes. All right. So for 10 years, it was my private health plan. And I would see Tony at all these events. And in 2012, he said to me, you should sell the sprouter with your worm business. And like, oh my gosh, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I love it. So that's kind of how it ties in because it is, it's I, what I offer is sustainable solutions for today's challenges, right? Worms for amending the soil, sprouts for eating, and laughter for overall health and wellness. So sprouts really are simply taking a bean or a seed, adding it into the system, either adding water or putting it in soil, and then that bean or seed comes to life. So they're just dormant when they're dry. They're just waiting to serve their purpose. You can grow sprouts in jars, paper towel. There's all kinds of sprouting systems. The one that, that I'm using, I call it the super simple sprouter because all you do, it's got a stainless steel mesh. It's plastic, plastic dome, plastic base. You just add a little bit of water and then the beans come to life. It's a little microclimate. So it's a little greenhouse uh, dome not in the window because you'll get bitter beans. It doesn't need to be in the sun. It can be in complete darkness. Some people will say, oh, I live in a basement. I don't have any windows. I can't do this. It's like, yes, you can. Story that you live in a basement, you have no windows, but you can still grow delicious, nutritious food. And I believe sprouts are nature's fast food, right? They germinate the mung beans. I'm talking about in Chinese food, the bean sprouts, the, the white beans. Yeah. Mm hmm they're a couple of inches long. Those are the beans that I eat. Now I eat them as soon as the the uh, root is the size of the bean. That's when they're most nutritious. So they contain fiber, protein, minerals, everything I, our body needs. They're hydrating, alkalizing, regenerative, biogenic. And I think the most important piece is that they're, they contain up to a hundred times more digestive enzymes than raw vegetables. Okay. Now, how long does it take to go from seeds to sprouts or to beans? 
Yeah, beautiful. So the mung beans are the fastest. They'll germinate in about 24 hours. Um, wow. Right? I know. In the summer, it's a little bit less time, a little bit faster in the winter, depending on, you know, the heat and humidity. So depending where you are in the world, um, in the winter, it may be 36 to 48 hours. I keep my, my place pretty cool in the winter. Okay. Now, you mentioned laughing yoga. Let's talk about that. How does that tie in with everything? And, you know, what is it? What are these three things that I'm juggling? I know what yeah. you're asking. <laughs> Back to 2012, when I started selling the Sproder, one more person said to me, ooh, worms in the house. And I, I think I didn't hear it the hundreds or thousands of times people had set it up to that 10 years. I think I just didn't, it just didn't, it didn't register. One more, one more person said, ooh, worms in the house, 2012. And I was like, how am I going to do this? This is too hard. I was about to give up my worm mission just because I thought this is, why do I care so much? I'm not sure why I care so much <laughs> when nobody else does. <laughs> and I was introduced to laughter yoga and I don't do yoga. So it's not yoga. I still don't do yoga, like traditional yoga or or yoga, okay. yoga. <laughs> and I know it's a great thing. Nothing against yoga. I was introduced to laughter yoga um, at a business event. The The speaker in, did a five minute laughter yoga exercise. And I was like, wow, what's that? That sounds fun. I love to laugh. And then that same week, I was at a networking event, of course, this was before COVID, hundreds of people. The very first woman I met was a laughter yoga teacher. I said, wow, twice in one week, laughter yoga is mainstream. Where have I been all this time? <laughs> and she said, no, it isn't. We trooped around that night together. And I was fascinated. Like I asked everybody, have you heard of laughter yoga? Have you heard of it? Have you? Have you? Nobody had. So I said, wow. Okay. So I started to attend her class, her laughter club. Super fun. And then I loved it so much, I became trained as a laughter leader. I loved that so much, I became trained as a laughter teacher. Now I teach leaders. And, and before COVID, I was going into laughter or into long-term care, working with folks with dementia, because it's not about jokes or comedy. It's laughter for the health of it. I didn't swear. <laughs> so it's intentional laughter exercises. And you need a club because laughing on your own, it's not easy. It's not easy laughing. Ha 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 ha. Oh, ha 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 ha. Right? Because our mind gets in the way. Our mind's like, what are you doing? Why are you laughing? It's weird. This is weird. You look weird. This is odd. I would say to people, come to a laughter club more than once. Like plan on coming at least twice so you can really experience it. Because the first time you'll be all in your head, what am I doing? What's going on here? <laughs> but then you feel great, right? When we're laughing, we're secreting the love drugs, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, our natural morphine, versus cortisol when we're stressed. Hmm. I'm in IT, and I think we specialize in cortisol. <laughs> cortisol so, production. <laughs> yes, exactly. So kind of... Yeah, what happens? I'm getting that this is not like if somebody stands up and tells jokes for 30 minutes. What should someone expect when they go? Yeah. And you're doing this online as well, correct? Right. Yeah. So um, with with COVID, again, it kind of forced everybody's converted online. IT is very busy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> IT help. I mean, I had my IT department this morning on call. <laughs> um, yeah. So what happens is in a laughter session, the laughter leader will, will lead the games. It's not about talking. It's not jokes or comedy. There's clapping. So when we're clapping, we're clapping palm to palm. And that's just for the people that are really serious. So we're clapping palm to palm. So we're activating the meridians. There's a little rhythm and a mantra. It's ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. And then once we, we kind of start that way and there's gentle movement. So that's, I guess, the yoga part is the gentle stretches and the practice. So it's deep diaphragmatic breathing. Our diaphragm is connected to all our organs. So when we're laughing, we're moving our diaphragm. Again, back to stress. 
you know, um, when we're stressed, we don't need our answering machine. We don't need our brain. So blood, lymph, oxygen leaves our head. So we can, all of those fluids will go into our muscles so we can escape, right? We're, we've gone into flight, fight, flight, freeze, or now fawn, which is a new one. I, have you heard of fawn? I have not. Yeah. So fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And fawning is doing something that you don't want to do as a pleaser. Like the people pleasers are like, oh, I really don't want to do that, but I'm going to do that. Like, so, you know, to placate, placate, placate somebody else, but going against ourselves. Okay. I, that mm. makes sense then. Yeah. So, so when we, when we laugh, it kind of forces us to oxygenate our body, right? Because you can't just exhale. You can't just ha, 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 because we're exhaling at that point. You have to at some point go, <gasps> ha, 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 so you can continue laughing. <laughs> and anybody that's listening or watching, you know, have you ever had laugh so hard that your belly's hurting, your cheeks are hurting, and you're like, stop, stop laughing, stop looking at me, I, I can't, oh my, oh, ha, ha. right, you're, you're like in pain because <laughs> you're laughing so hard. Those are the laughter muscles. You okay. want those. So how does this all tie in together? So it ties in together because I, I in 2012, I, I was introduced to laughter. It helped save my, my worm business. I was like, okay, it's not personal that people aren't buying worms. It's because they're afraid. So now, so I came back out networking. I stopped networking for a little while. I was just kind of getting tired thinking everyone knows I have worms. Everyone knows I'm here. Newsflash, everybody. If you're in business, you need to still be visible. Otherwise, you become invisible, <laughs> right? You queer get out of people's mind, even if you have something as unique as a worm business. People just mm -hmm. don't think about you as a solution. So you need to stay present. You need to keep on networking. But I came back out as a networker, and I was only talking about laughter. So it's interesting. Pe people that met me, after 2012, knew me only as a laughter yogi, yogi. <laughs> and, I, and they didn't know I had worms. And so whenever I mentioned worms, they were like, what is this worm thing you keep talking about? And it was, I, I'm just like, oh, gosh, I was the worm lady, and now I'm the laughing lady, and who am I? <laughs> yeah, so I kind of get people laughing now, and then they like me. And, and then I can, you know, say, hey, by the way, I have worms too. And rather than coming at it as, hey, I have worms and you can too. And it's a really good thing. And I was, I think I was being a little bit too aggressive with my, my worm mission where I thought this is really important. We need this. Yeah. And people don't buy what they need. <laughs> they buy what they want. They buy what they want. It's really about messaging. That's listening, thinking about being an entrepreneur over 40. You know, I hope you're listening, you know, but people still need what I have. They do. It's just, how are you, how, how can I message it so that it's like something they want? Like, do you like eating? Are you a gardener? Do you want to have better soil? Maybe you want to get worms. <laughs> okay. So. How do you manage all of your endeavors, you know, both, you know, from the worm farming to the the sprout, the sprouts and, you know, the laughing yoga? Because I can imagine the laughing yoga, I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that's pretty much one to one you. I, I could see the worm farming and the sprouts maybe being you could do that on the back burner a little bit. I'm, I may be totally wrong about that. Yeah. So how do I manage all the things? I, I laugh a lot, which helps me get out of stress. I'm a laughter teacher. So for the laughter part, yes, I do lead sessions, but I'm also a teacher. So I'm teaching other leaders so that more people can lead the demographic and it fits everywhere. You know, Greg, we need this laughter more than ever. We have a mental health tsunami, which was here before COVID it's just now we need to look at it because uh, more people are vulnerable, more people are exposed, more people are isolated. And when we're on our own, we are social creatures. Even the introverts need people sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a major extrovert. 20, uh, 2020, I, I started my club online. I didn't have a laughter club because I, kept, I said, the universe, I don't want to do free laughter club because I want to get paid gigs. So I kept getting paid laughter gigs. 
<laughs> and people would say, I want to come to your laughter club. And I'd say, I don't have one. I keep getting paid gigs. <laughs> uh, and then COVID, everything stopped, right? I wasn't going into long-term care because they weren't having anybody in. Even still today, they're not having a lot of outside guests come in. So I started my club because I needed to laugh. I needed connection with people. Now I'm so grateful. I have a, a free laughter club and I, everyone's welcome. It's Tuesday mornings, 9.30 Eastern time, 30 minutes on Zoom, 30 minutes, super fun self-care. I get people from around the world coming to my club. And that's the beauty of it because you can Zoom in. It's not about jokes or comedy. It's comedy. So you don't really need to understand. I, I do speak English in my club, but you don't really need to understand the language because you're just like playing along. You're just following. And so people have... Hopefully they'd have it on gallery view rather than speaker view. So because we're playing together when you're in a laughter club, it's making eye contact. So that's why the gallery view is beautiful. You can look at each other. You use your camera. So we're kind of playing, you know, doing games. You can clean your camera. Oop, you're foggy. <laughs> right. So cleaning your camera, waving at each other, doing high fives. Like, so it's really just little games. And as the leader, you just like lead people along. So you do deep diaphragmatic breathing, some clapping and chanting, some laughter exercises, and you end with a beautiful laughter meditation. And now these words that I'm saying, yoga, it discounts a lot of people that don't like yoga or know the benefit of it. So it's not yoga. I have rock hard abs. So for people that want to be in good shape, laughing is super fun. And I have rock hard abs just from laughing, right? Because we're moving our whole body. It's a cardiovascular workout. So meditation, again, when people hear meditation, they're like, oh, I tried that. It didn't work. There's a couple of types of meditation still, which is the one that if people are not seasoned meditators, it, it can be a challenge when people are starting, you know, like, oh, sit still. Don't, don't worry about your thoughts. Just let them go. Thank them. And what's like, what? Think of your thoughts as clouds, right? They just come and go and, oh, there's another one. Okay, there it is, right? Or like waves that, you, you know, they just are constant. So are our thoughts. Laughter meditation is dynamic meditation. So you don't have to worry about your thoughts. You don't have to worry about anything. You just laugh. So at the end of the laughter class, 30 or 30 minutes or an hour, um, you're all warmed up. You're all connected. And... From NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, when, we, when you're all breathing together, right, you're all in rapport, you're all connected, and you're kind of breathing as one, and it's a beautiful thing. So then we laugh, and it's organic. So you laugh for a minute or two or, or five, that's, that's not easy, laughing full on, ha, 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 right? And then it, it burbles up like, Especially in person, on, on Zoom, the leader has to just kind of decide when they feel that it's over. But in person, it's such a beautiful thing. You know, then one person might be like, it's like, ha, whoo, and people, ha, ha, whoo. And then, and then it starts to be funny, and then ha, 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 it burbles up again. And, you know, it really becomes contagious in a good way. And then um, when it's over the laughter leader speaks again. You ask people to refrain from talking because you don't want to engage your brain. You want to be full in your body, just feeling the laughter. Um, and then and then I, I end with, you know, asking people to share this, like just to close your eyes if you're comfortable, not everybody is, and just continue to breathe deep and feel because you really have expelled a lot of energy when you laugh for a few minutes. And you just feel like wonderful. And, and it's not often that we get to just sit and, and revel in that floaty, beautiful feeling. So I ask people to share that magic medicine, right? Laughter is the best medicine. Share mm -hmm. that high vibration energy that we just created with anyone in their mind that they know could use it, including themselves to take some of that healing energy for themselves. And then after that, um, Dr. Kateri was the founder of Laughter Yoga. I don't think I mentioned that. It started in India by a medical doctor, Dr. Madan Kateria. His goal is world peace. It's a global movement. So at, after 
I say, after you've handed out all the energy to all the people that you know could use it, let's help Dr. Kateria and his goal of world peace. Let's send some of this healing energy to places in the world that could use it. And there's lots, right? There's lots of places that are struggling right now. And that's yeah. how I end. Then I just thank everyone for coming. And for the new people, I ask them, like, just notice how you feel the rest of the day because the effects of laughing stay with you for several hours, right? The oxygen, your bodies, all your cells are all oxygenated. You have energy. You feel good. You're alert. Creativity, right? Your brain is open. It's like all the synapses are firing. It's an incredible thing. And I, I really wish more people knew about. And I, I think that what happened was laughter was squished out of us like centuries ago because you can't control people when they're laughing full on. Yeah, and even today in the political climate that we're in, comedy, which is how a lot of people get to laugh, is being discouraged. I could see where laughter yoga would has a place. And if anyone thinks that we're not in the uh, a tsunami of mental health crisis, just read the news. No, don't read the news. You'll be one of the mental health people. Yeah. <laughs> well, just look at the headlines. <laughs> right. I was going to ask you what has worm farming meant for you personally, but I think we could extend that to both the sprouts and you know, laughing laughter yoga as well. How has that changed your life? Ah, oh, the, uh, the three thing. Thank you. The three things that I do, the worms, the sprouts, the laughter, these are the things I do. It's not something I talk about or it's just my business. It's my life. This is my life. I eat sprouts every day, 20 years. I laugh every day, well, since 2012, 10 years. <laughs> and worm composting. I, I manage most of my scraps through the worms or through composting. So it is my life. I, I really think that I do have simple solutions for today's challenges it's something that I feel really strongly about. I feel on purpose. Let's say that I feel very driven about what I'm doing. And sometimes I think I can be overbearing with, with my message. I used to be, you know, so nice. Oh, I know you're afraid. Of, oh, I know that. And now I'm like, no, it's, 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 it's time for my nice girl to, to go away and for not for me to be, aggressive, but I really want people to hear my message. I really want people to know that it's urgent. This is really important. I don't care if you get worms or not. I don't want people to say, I didn't know. Oh, I lived in an apartment for 10 years. I didn't know. Now, you know, and now you can choose to do or not to do, but you know. Okay. What's next for Kathy and Rick? Oh, for Kathy and Rick. Let's see. I think we're just going to can. Rick is Kathy's husband and IT support. <laughs> he's my right partner. hand guy. No. Yeah. He's my rock for sure. Yeah. That's a great question. What's in our future? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think just more of the same and we're just going to keep on, just keep on the sustainability wagon. Okay. Well, let's get ready to wrap this up. What book do you currently recommend to move someone to start their own worm farming business or laughter yoga or, you know, Maybe there's another book that you, you know, recommend that's different, that doesn't fit into those categories. Yeah, I would suggest a book because I, I think for anyone to think about anything outside of themselves, they need to be in a great spot themselves. So a book that I would really highly recommend is by a, a man named Michael Singer uh, called Unte The Untethered Soul. And it's just about how we have this kind of shadow side, this part that tries to sabotage us. And, you know, why do we keep dating the same person over and over and having the same results? So that's the same guy again. Not me because I've been married all these years. Why do I keep doing the same things over and over and having the same results? Oh, because you keep doing the same things over and over. This book, I just, I just found it really um, helpful. I've read it a few times now. And every time new messages, it's just about how to, how to be more of yourself. Okay. Now what's the best way for someone to contact you or to check you out online? So Rick is my web guy and my website is blissfully up to date. That's probably the best place. It's Kathy's composters.com. 
But I do have Kathy Sprouters and Kathy's Club too for the worms and or the sprouts and the laughter. Okay. And lastly, what's the number one piece of advice that you can give for our listeners? Oh, the best piece of advice I would give is be true to yourself. Like, what is it that you want? Go after that. Don't wait because don't just wish. You know, people say, oh, you know, Rick and I traveled in Africa and Asia for 13 months when we were 27. <laughs> Wow. And people say, I want to go to Africa. If you want to go to Africa, what do you got to do? You got to get a passport. So get a passport, <laughs> right? Yeah. If you want to travel, then you need to have a passport. If you want to travel outside of your country. So get that, you know, do research. What What is it that you want? I would say um, life is really short and we never know. We don't know from one day to the next. No one knew this pandemic was coming, right? But here we are two years in. And I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that are like, oh, my gosh, you know, why, you know, at the beginning of this thing, I said, what if this is goes on for five years? What do you want to have at the end of that? What do you want to have accomplished? You need to do it now. You need to start. Right. You can't be like doing the same thing every day. You got to change something. So I would say really, really figure out what it is that you want to do yourself. What do you want? And go after it. Great advice. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you, Kathy, for being a guest on Entrepreneurs Over 40. Thank you, Greg. Check out the newly redesigned Entrepreneurs Over 40 website at www.entrepreneursover40.com. While you're there, sign up to get updates from us. Also, don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss any other episodes. Thank you for listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40. Check us out at entrepreneursover40.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast directory.